wants a bunk bed, Bell. There's never been a better time to sign up for a yearly EPP, Extra Podcast Person Membership, to Real Ghost Stories Online. Right now, when you become a yearly EPP, you'll get one month free membership to our EPP programs. You'll also be able to claim your very own bunk bed bell plus you'll be doing your part to help keep our show on the air it's amazing it's all amazing we feel so much better a show that helps thousands of people worldwide thanks again for uh, providing this outlet and making it so non-threatening feel not so alone with their haunting experiences you guys are amazing um we listen to you all the time become a yearly epp now get a free month of our epp membership and Get your very own bunk bed bell. Hurry though, supplies are limited. If you're currently a monthly EPP, then upgrade your membership now to a yearly membership and get your bunk bed bell and a free month of EPP membership to Real Ghost Stories Online. I think it's important for people to be able to have a place where they can share their experiences and validate them because these things are real. Sign up now to be a yearly EPP at ghostpodcast.com. And thanks for your support. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. That indeed it is. The phone number 855-853-4802. Of course, you can write it at realghoststoriesonline.com, uh, or you can always email me your audio file. If you have a ghost story you recorded on your mobile device and want to share it that way, just send it to Tony, T-O-N-Y, at realghoststoriesonline.com. So lots of ways to get those stories to us. Social media, we're there. Facebook is kind of like where everybody discusses a lot of uh, the show, their stories uh, within the community. Just look up Real Ghost Stories Online there. Twitter, we're at Ghost Story Radio. Instagram, at Ghost Podcast. And Snapchat, at Ghost Podcast as well, if you want to find us any of those locations the other day i posted a uh, uh, creepy house photo to instagram <laughs> that was so fun <laughs> that's uh you know so many people use instagram and that I, i'll admit i'm a little i was there when it started uh-huh. i used it in its like infancy and then i kind of fell off it forever uh really and still am off of it for a, a good portion of it uh but i'm trying to use it more because there's a lot of people that it, and i love photography you'd think i would be more into it mm -hmm. but uh i just i haven't been uh but anyway i posted that uh that creepy house photo that we drove by the other day and it was like i was amazed just within a couple minutes just into the hundreds of likes on it on there and like oh <laughs> i should use this platform more um and lots of people saying you know they're epps or love the show i'm like oh i didn't even realize you could comment the way you do on there i'm so slow on some of these things some things i'm i'm all on top of so i'm like oh holy shit the obvious is staring me in the face you're gonna have to teach me how to use it yeah it's fun yeah it's, it's like facebook with pictures okay essentially but like you facebook need, has pictures it does but you need it's like it's only pictures okay and there's a little bit of video in there but it's mainly pictures that people use um, and it's just fun, the filters and everything. And <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, that's, uh, we, we were driving down, uh, uh, God knows where in Missouri and, uh, so many neat places, mm -hmm. uh, around, uh, here where there's abandoned homes or we, we think might be abandoned homes, uh, just like old, like farmsteads and things of that nature. And, uh, this one we drove by, we just came around the corner and it just stood out and it just had, what would you call the architecture where those windows were on the, the upper floor? Uh, on the front, it had a, it's called a mansard roof. Okay. And that's where the roof comes down and yep. you've got the windows. It, I think there's not a real good example to give, uh, I think the the house on the Munsters had <laughs> part of that. But. It, it's just like if you want your house to look like a haunted house someday, that's the type of roof. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it screamed, this is a haunted house. And it was difficult to tell. We were just kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I just, and we, we don't usually stop to take pictures of these houses. <laughs> but no. I really think we should. We should do more of that. Well, but this one, I was kind of like, the more I looked at it, the more I think somebody still lived there. And I was yeah. like, I wanted you to hurry and get back in the car. Well, the interesting thing about it was, I mean, all the windows are broken out in the upstairs, at least. The downstairs, a couple were. And you can look at the photo. It's on all of our social media accounts. Um, and it was posted about the 19th uh, of February 2017, in case you're listening to this in 2025. Um, the it looked It looked uninhabitable. However... There was uh, a a direct TV or dish dish 
<laughs> on the side of the house. And I'm just thinking, really? And, and the propane tank looked fairly new. Yeah. Like so, no rust spots yeah. on there or anything. So. Yeah. And, and the other the other tell that I was curious about is the driveway wasn't overgrown. A lot of times the houses that are out there that no one's in, it's fairly overgrown. The yard was grown mm -hmm. a little bit, but it was like, there's a clear path going back and forth here. So I don't know. Maybe I wonder if someone just farms the area. And maybe that's like the or bathroom they're, <laughs> building. They're fixing it up and not living yeah. in it. Yeah. Maybe something like, I don't know. Uh, but it was neat. It's creepy. It's on social media. And <laughs> and within like minutes, people were pointing out areas of, is that a ghost in the, the window? Because there was a questionable shadow on the ground that did look like a, a dog shadow. Yeah. But... I, I really think the way that those branches and those just haunted looking trees were, I think it was just the shadow of that that made that stand out. And the the resolution from my phone to the internet, uh, it, it dumbs it down a little bit. And, and the, the, that was an oak tree and the oaks around here still have some of their brown yeah. leaves on them. And I think honestly, it was that in front of the window that kind of looked like it did. A face. And I will give them that. It, there, there's another window in that picture where off in the corner, and I should bring it up on my computer, uh, which I've not done yet. There is what does appear to be a bit of a facial outline reflection. It's kind of odd. Okay. Uh, and it's not one that anyone had pointed out yet. Believe it or not, I'm the one who found it. I'm it's usually the last person to... No, <laughs> no one's pointed it out. It's either like, I'm the only one who's going to see this thing, or it's... I don't know. I, I, I got Like I said, I got to pull it up on here beyond just my phone to see what I think of it. But anyway... Fun stuff. We'll try and get more of those uh, those photos as we uh, meander around here. I think everybody really enjoys those. 855-853-4802 uh, is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Hi, let's hear your story. Hi, my name is Laura, and I'm in Lawrence, Kansas, so there's a lot of history there. Um, let's see, where do I start? Um, sorry, I'm driving, so I was a little bit unprepared for this, but I just recently started listening to your podcast. Um because almost all of my life I have been dealing with paranormal things and I am very empathic and sensitive to the paranormal. Um, I'm just going to give you the first story because I have a lifetime of stories and I plan on writing you a letter later on detailing some of the creepier ones and some of the more sad ones. Um, but where it all started was when I was four years old, I had a medical condition uh, which almost killed me. Um, I had to have three-fourths of my stomach removed, um, and I was on the brink of death. I was very close to dying, and I was in a children's hospital. It was a children's-only hospital, and um, I remember one night, it was one of the worst nights that I had had. You know, they didn't think I was going to make it through till the morning. I remember laying in my bed, in my hospital bed, and I had had an empty room, um, and in the bed next to me, I was, or it was at nighttime, the bed next to me was an older woman. Um, I remember she had short, kind of, you know, gray hair. Um, she was very nice. I got a very, you know, like, comforting vibe from her, um, and I knew it wasn't one of the nurses because I had I'd met all the nurses, and I, she wasn't dressed as a nurse. Um, and I don't remember exactly what she talked to me about, but I do remember that she talked to me most of that night and really made me feel comforted and that everything was going to be okay. And then the next day I told my mom about it. You know, there was this really nice lady in the room with me last night. You know, she was hooked up to the IVs. You know, she was a patient there. And she was really nice to me. And my mom said, of course, no, you know, this is a children's only hospital. You're probably just dreaming. But I knew that I was not dreaming. Um, I knew that I was not making it up. It was too real. And then, so this is in the 90s, by the way. So, you know, there's emails and we have, you know, like landline uh, phones in the hospital. Um, so the next evening, it was late at night. I recall this very vividly my phone in my room started ringing and I picked it up and it was this lady's voice, um, the one that had visited me the night before. And she told me, Laura, everything is going to be okay. You are going to get through this and you're going to grow up and be very healthy and successful in your life. And you don't need to worry about anything. And you have a lot of 
spirits watching out for you, which now that I think about it is a little bit creepier than maybe it affected me when I was younger. But I remember just saying, you know, thank you. And I, we hung up the phone and that was that. And I never heard from her or saw her again, but I have had, um, many, many, many experiences with the paranormal in my life, and I am very excited to write and tell you the rest of them, but I thought that I would just give you a call and tell you where it all started, um, and that was in Boston, by the way, the, the hospital that I was at, so clearly a lot of history in Boston as well, um, but yeah, I love your podcast, um, it's very... Um, I don't know. It makes me feel a lot better to know that I'm not crazy and I'm not the only one that experiences these things. So I really appreciate everything you do. Um, I have the majority of my stories that I'm going to write to you about are going to be in the Kansas area and it's full of fun stories. So I cannot wait to tell you. Um, Thanks again, guys. Keep doing what you're doing. I love it so much. Bye-bye. I wonder sometimes if you have somebody that's sensitive and then they have a near life ex- a near death near life near death experience if that then you know takes their sensitivity and really really amps it up because sometimes people become sensitive after a near death experience mm-hmm. so it makes you wonder if that just is amplified exponentially i i think when it comes to something like that where it is uh literally a you know, obviously there was like a surgical procedure done. There was mm-hmm. something, it wasn't just, oh, I almost got hit by that train and I got out of the way. You could consider that near death to a certain extent. Sure. Uh, you know, or, you know, oh my God, I was walking to the tracks and I saw the was right, right behind me and I jumped out of the way and I lived. Mm-hmm. Um, there's that type of near death experience and there's this type of near death experience that she described mm-hmm. where it's, there's literally something wrong with you and, and they're, they have to get fixed right. medically. Uh, where the body is, you know, could die without the modern medicine, probably would have. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that that's much more adaptive to having that happen, mm-hmm. where your your level goes up as far as the sensitivity, as opposed to just, um, I came really close to something bad happening and dying. Sure. Uh, so I think there's there's a, there's a, a difference in, in the definition of the near death. I'm just wondering if you're sensitive to begin with, you're one of those people that's just born that way and mm-hmm. you have that, if it makes you even more sensitive than somebody that would go through a near-death experience. I just was curious because it sounds like she's got a lot of spirits that sure. are going around with her and it makes you wonder if that's the case for just about anybody that goes through a near-death experience or if, if maybe her light shines even a little bit brighter, maybe she was already sensitive. So she's already bright and now she's like, like uh, a spot, ten thousand, a hundred thousand watt candlelight that you something sh- like that shine at deer. Okay, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go shining for some deer. Did you ever hear that? No. That's uh, that's something they they did in Wisconsin quite a bit. Uh-huh. I never, I never did it. And uh, is that deer hunting at night? I don't know. I mean, it was. I don't. I really. I honestly don't understand the point of it. And and someone can fill me in on this. Um. I should know this because I'm from up there, but it was, you, you go out and you have like the, the flashlight, the giant, you know, mega flashlight and you shine it around at deer. And I don't know if it's just like you find them, tag your it, or if there's like a purpose to this of like, uh, you know, it, it's like involved with the hunting to scare them off some direction or I just remember kids doing this, and I know they weren't hunting. They were just like, "It's Saturday night. We have nothing else to do. We're gonna go shining for deer." I don't. I don't know. That's also called driving home at night in the Ozarks. That's true. Um, I mean, it was driving home at night there too, but it was like with these express, you know, mission of not just the headlights shining. I don't know. I'm gonna Google this uh-huh. while and, and understand part of my childhood. Uh, while we listen to the next, so story. like that's something like high school kids would say, "Let's go do that." Yeah, uh, I I would have rather gone cow tipping. That's so much more fun. Yeah, they did that too. That's more fun. I've never done that. That that seems cruel. No, because like they can get up. You're just startling an animal. That's never a good idea. It's gonna be 
hamburger in a month anyway. So <laughs> I don't think I don't think farmers ever appreciated their cows. I, I didn't even know, like. And what do you do with that? Is that they sleep standing up? So you just startle them. You just knock and you just them over. tip them over. Yeah. Is that that's how it works? It's fun. Yeah. Have you done it? I have done it. Wow. So then, what happens when do they wake up? Are they like shit? They kind of. They, are they what? Are they like shit? What happened? <laughs> in, in cow language. Though. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like when you startle yourself awake. It's just the cow version. Aren't of they that. like pissed and like look like want to? Well, you don't go do it to the ones with horns that are the bull. Gonna, yeah, yeah, you okay. don't do that. You just do it to like the dairy they cows. Call it cow tipping, not bull tipping. All these things I never did. You just go out there, do it. There you go. Yeah. There's not much to do when you're a teenager in Kansas. That's clean fun. Besides tipping over cows. That's clean fun. There you go. Yeah. 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Hi. Hi. My name is Brooke, and I listen to your show all the time. First off, I just want to say that I think what y'all do is amazing. Um, This is a really long story, so I'm just going to try to keep it short. And it's a couple sections, so to say, I'll call back another time and let y'all know some more. But I wanted to tell y'all about the house I grew up in and even the impact it still has on my life today, um, years later. And I have a husband, a child now. Um, when I was two years old, my parents had just gotten married. They had only been married for maybe five years. And they moved from Michigan to Houston, Texas. Um, hey, y'all. And they bought a house in this neighborhood where they had nice houses all around them, good schools, you know, there was a a golf course right down the street. I mean, it was just beautiful to begin with. And all the houses were way out of their price range. You know, they were first time parents and first house. And my dad was a handyman and, you know, he wanted to take on a project and they just fell in love with this one house. And My dad said that when he walked in there the first time that he thought it needed a lot of work, um, but he felt like it could be a family home and he could make it instead. And the man that they bought it from had told them that his wife had died there and they had lived there for over 30 years and that they loved that house. And his wife said that it was her favorite place to be. And he had let that house fall into disarray and didn't take care of it because uh, his age, his wife had died a couple years before that, and it just kind of fell apart, but he didn't want to leave because he loved it so much, and I think he felt connected to his wife. And anyways, my parents said that when they moved in, my dad was remodeling, and I was like two years old, and he said that he would put me in this one room, which was later on my bedroom, and he would put me in front of the mirror, and there was like all these toys, and he said that I would put all my toys in front of it and play with myself and just have fun, you know, like most two-year-olds talking to myself. And he said that he would come in there and I would always be pointing to the mirror and acting like I was talking to somebody. And he said he didn't really think anything of it. My parents aren't super religious and they weren't really back then. Uh, They didn't really believe in anything. They never had any events happen. They weren't really believers, I guess. And my dad said like over the course of like two or three years, like when I was about five years old, He said I started to tell him that I had a friend in the mirror. Um, I don't remember this now being an adult, but my parents would never lie about anything like that. And a lot of the incidents that we had later on, you know, it clarifies that this actually did happen. So I 100% believe in it. And I know my parents would never lie about that. My dad said he came in there one day and he asked me who I was playing with. And I told him I was playing with the woman in the mirror. And my dad asked me, oh, you know, joking around, thinking I'm just a five-year-old imaginary friend. He asked me what this woman's name was. And I said her name was Luby. And my dad didn't really think anything of it. And at that point, like, I had started, I forget, like, what extracurricular activities. And my dad said that he started to go around the neighborhood more. And he started meeting more neighbors. And, you know, I, I had a little brother then also. And... He said that he befriended this woman down the street, and my mom also, and that she had told them about this woman that had passed away in the house, and how after she died, the house kind of scared them. And they would try to come over to check on the guy that lived there, her husband, and they had a really sad story. Uh, Apparently, they were married, they had three kids, and the one son was mentally ill, 
and went camping with some friends, and a drunk driver plowed over their tent, and it killed him instantly. And apparently he was into rodeo, he was into animals, he was into, you know, all kinds of, just, I mean, Texas, you know, he was one of those people. And my my parents were like, that's really sad, you know, and then uh, their other daughter, she died during childbirth, and their grandchild died also. So it was just, this whole family just had this sad I don't know, like, when I hear of it, I think of, like, this just sad vibe. And whenever my parents moved um, into this house, like, over the course of several years, it just started to escalate as we got older. And my little brother never really had anything happen to him. Um, my parents said it was mainly me, and they had a couple instances that popped up. I remember when I was a little girl, and I would be laying in my room, and sometimes I would feel, like, when the covers were up over me, I would feel like somebody was sitting on the bed. The bed would kind of go down a little bit. And I remember there was this huge mirror, and I had these beautiful old dressers that my mom had gotten from some antique place, but I don't think that has anything to do with it. And uh, my, my mom said that I would start crying, and they wouldn't understand why I was crying. And apparently, I would see this woman in the mirror, and as I got older, I do remember this, because... I would lay there, and I would see a reflection out of the corner of my eye, like of the hallway, and I would always feel like somebody was walking through it. And it was really weird, and it used to really creep me out. And I remember having to go to the bathroom and looking down the hallway, and I would see like a white dress go across the floor. And the thing is, my parents know how kids are, so they didn't really play into it, and they didn't really tell us a lot. And what I found out later on, because I lived in this house until I was like 14 years old, and what I found out later on when I was probably 11 or 12 is that this woman had died and they told me, you know, her name is Lucy, and my dad told me a story I'd never heard. And this is where the neighbor comes into the story. He said that when I was about five that they had started meeting the neighbors and he said he brought me over to her house and they had, and this woman had been friends with Lucy. That was actually the woman's name that lived in the house. Yes, and that is the name that my imaginary friend was. So call it coincidence, I don't know. This woman had been dead before I even lived there. My parents had moved from Michigan, so they didn't know anybody. So there's no way we could have found this out from anybody. And my dad said that he took me there because she had said the woman's name was Ruby, and it kind of freaked her out a little bit. And she wanted to see if I could recognize her. This woman took all these pictures and put them on the table and told me to pick out who I, who I thought Ruby was. And she said uh, that all the pictures I pointed to were of Luby. And there were pictures of everybody in there that I had no idea who they were. Like just random people from her family, like from church, you know, whatever. And I picked out the pictures of Luby. So my parents said that whenever that happened, it kind of confirmed for them that this was real and this was happening. And my mom said it kind of concerned her and scared her. And pretty much since then, um, that's just, a little bit of it, and I can call back in another time and let y'all know a little bit more, but mainly throughout my whole life, from where I've moved from place to place, I feel like this woman has made an attachment with me because I found out less than a year ago from my dad um, that she had actually died in my room, not the room that I thought she had died in. So all those times where I felt like she was sitting on my bed and the couch, or the, not the couch, but the bed was sinking in, it really, uh, in my head, I, I really think that happened. I don't think my parents played into it, and I remember the dreams I would have. Like, it, it'd be like I was walking down the hallway, and it's always like the house was empty, and it used to scare me. And I remember I had a hall, like the, the closet in my room, I would leave open, cracked with the light on, because it would scare me in the dark. I would get scared because sometimes I would see stuff and I would just close my eyes and just act like I didn't see anything and it seemed to stop usually and I got scared. And I remember watching the string in the closet rock back and forth, back and forth, back and forth and there was no airflow. There was, you know, I mean I was a kid but now when I think of it there was nothing in there that could have caused that, like nothing at all. And I can only believe that that's what happened and I feel like even now that I have an attachment because no matter where I've lived where I've moved, I've always had weird things happen. My mom thinks that they're attracted to me. Um, I personally think that it's her. I'm not sure at this point in my life, and I guess I'll continue to see what happens, but 
Um, sorry, I don't mean to take up all y'all's time. Um, I love y'all so, but this is definitely my most, this is where it started as far as like paranormal activities and encounters. And, you know, yes, I did see what I saw. And yes, I did see her walk down the hallway and I saw things move. We had things go missing in the house, but yet they would appear later on. And the thing is, is that my little brother and me, stuff would happen where it was too tall for us to put something like stuff like that where nobody had been in there where you could just tell that something something was up and my dad and my mom never fed into it because they didn't want to scare us because mind you this was our childhood home they wanted us to have a happy childhood and it was nothing but that we it it was horrible with what happened in the house and there was abuse from a family member, um, and it goes on and on, and I feel like this place has so much negative energy in it. And since my parents had sold that house, we moved out when I was like 14, um, like they've had like six owners. And I've looked up just occasionally, probably a couple times a year, I'll Google it just to see if it's on the market, and it's always on the market. So it's just kind of weird. Um, but I will call in another time, and I hope you all have a great day. Um, and thank you for doing what y'all do because people like me, it makes me feel like I'm when I do this. And it died. And it died. You know, I don't, I don't know that that's something she wants to have attached to her, but I honestly feel like maybe from her call, and of course I don't know how she's feeling about it and everything, but knowing what this woman went through in her life and and everything. And the way she played with, you know, our caller as a child, it, it almost sounds like maybe she was just kind of motherly towards her, mm -hmm. you know, because she lost a, a, a daughter in childbirth and they lost a grandchild. And it just kind of, I don't know, I almost feel like it's, it's scary, but not, not meant to be. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense at all? Sure. I mean, it's just a matter of how you perceive a ghost. I mean, it, it'd be very... If if the idea of a ghost is scary to you, it can be, you know, Teddy Ruxpin, a nice Teddy Ruxpin ghost, <laughs> uh, and it's still going to be scary. Sure, sure. I just, that's at least the the impact I'm getting from her call. And of yeah. course, there's so much more to the story when you live it, but I don't, I don't know. I honestly don't feel like this one's trying to do harm. She just happens to be freaking everyone out. Yeah, but you know, I mean, it's probably more common than, than not it is. with a ghost. It is. So, yeah, I, I get what you're. It's like inadvertently freaking them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see that. Thank you for the story and sharing that experience with us. 855 853 4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. And now, uh, the more you know moment. Oh, God, what? Deer shining has been practiced by hunters and non-hunters alike in Wisconsin for decades. Shining consists of using bright lights to spot locations of active deer herds. Since deer feel safer at night, they tend to be the most active during this time, which is why hunters prefer to scout at night. Tools used to shine deer include high-powered, handheld lights, usually one million candle lights, along with a pair of binoculars. The lights and binoculars can be found at any hunting camping store or online. Before shining, it's always a good idea to check on shining regulations in your area if you're unsure of what the laws are in your county are. There you go. And the writer of this uh, from hubpages.com slash animal slash deer shining in Wisconsin has a personal note that says, My dad, his buddies, and I have been shining ever since I can remember. My mom and dad's first date with shining deer. Uh, as you can see around here, shining is a common pastime. Today, my dad and our hunting buddies and I uh, deer shine uh, to uh, uh, to find where the deer have moved from year to year. So it's kind of like getting an idea where they're going to be. So it's kind of like figuring out where the deer live. It's uh, it's like reconnaissance on the deer. Okay, it's kind of fun. It's interesting, yeah. So I, I and I guess I never understood there was purpose. Uh -huh. And you know what? Probably for some of the kids there is none. Mm -hmm. It's just let's go see who we can find deer. Uh, but there is indeed purpose if you're hunting. So they're not actually hunting no, at night because it, I was thinking that sounds extremely dangerous. It is. And there's laws against it. Okay. I mean, there's laws. You cannot be in possession of a firearm when you're shining. Okay. Because uh, people could do that. Uh, it's it's more so just, oh, this is kind of their path because mm -hmm. they do have their routines, if you will. And you want, it gives you a better idea of then when you do go hunting, oh, this is, I guess, the area you want to be in. That's what I'm gathering. Okay. 
Okay. There you go. I've now understood a term I've heard my whole life and just didn't quite know what the heck it meant. Sounds a little less absurd than uh, cow tipping, so I'll concede that. Boo doo doo doo. That's great. The more you know. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number. Uh, one of our listeners uh, in Norway the other day sent me uh, that, uh, just a, a, a Snapchat, and it was just simply the, the, the star shining with the more you know logo on it from 1998. Because <laughs> um, we were talking, they are asking, like, because I said I have, uh, I guess, relatives there, um, but it's, you know, distant, distant cousins. Mm-hmm. It's, it's uh, I have... Uh, lineage from Norway, but way back. But I remember when I was a kid, my aunt um, did research before the world of Ancestry.com and all that, where you actually really, you had to kind of chart this out on your own and do a lot of calling and investigating work. Yeah. She did it. Oh, cool. And uh, actually discovered like third or fourth cousins over there. Mm -hmm. And I believe somebody went and visited them at one point in time. And uh, because he was asking like, well, what, what part? And uh, Laplander is uh, where I have, uh, I guess, uh, the the Norwegian version of me. <laughs> so that's that's way up there. Yeah, I'm related to Santa. You go with that. You I just keep telling yourself. I that. tell Harper that all the time. She's like, really? She's am, gonna think am that I an she elf? really is. She's gonna <laughs> think Santa was like her great 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 whatever, and that's gonna be great when she discovers the whole Santa. There's, you know, there's, conspiracy. there's worse bullshit for children to believe than that. <laughs> yeah. At least mine's like semi true. There's a semi truth to it. Although we could like do one of those uh, genetic kits and then I'm going to find out just like the commercials are like, oh, this time I thought I, I was uh, Italian. Turns out I'm from the South Arctic. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay. It's like, wait a second. Nobody lives there. According to this genetic survey, I'm from the South Pole. I want to do the the dog version of that and find out what the hell bear is. I want to, I want to do one of those kits and send it in as a human, but but uh, the the DNA I'm sending back is from the dog, <laughs> just to see. Well, it turns out uh, it's very odd the uh, regions that people aren't known to have lived there. It's <laughs> messed up. And uh, you might want to get uh, checked uh, for fleas uh, or, or some sort of, you know, dog disease. That worms. They... <laughs> it turns out you might have worms as well as uh, being from God knows where. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Hi. Hey, guys. This is Chris. I'm calling from Madison, Wisconsin. I called before to share a story with you guys about when I was a baby. Um, and my mom running out of the apartment in the snow. I don't know if you guys shared it. I haven't heard it. Unfortunately, I'm not an EPP member as of yet, but that's coming, I promise. Um, I just wanted to call with the icon trying to go in order of the stories. So I have stories from far back as I can remember to, you know, a couple days ago. Um, So this story real quick, try not to make it too long. My grandma and grandpa moved into a new apartment. They moved out of their house into a new apartment. Never had been in the apartment before. Um, walked in. As soon as I walked in, I was very familiar and very at home in the apartment. I knew the layout of the apartment. I knew where the, knew what the kitchen was going to look like. I knew where the bathroom was. I'd been there before. I knew this apartment, um, and I didn't put it together then. But you know, thinking back on it all these years, I, I as soon as I crossed the threshold of this apartment, I was seeing this apartment through someone else's eyes. But didn't think much of it really. Kind of went on doing our thing. Uh, a little time went by, I'd spend the night there a lot, sleep on the couch. There was a long hallway that ran from the front of the apartment, pretty much through the whole apartment, all the way back into the kitchen. And it passed like uh, one of the bedrooms and another living, another um, dining room area and a hallway. So one night I'm sleeping and I hear somebody obviously walking through the apartment. This place had really creaky floors. It was an old Chicago um, apartment building. and very clearly heard someone walking up to the couch where I was and stop right at where my head was at the end of the couch where the hallway ended. And I sat up thinking it was my grandma or my aunt or somebody. And to my surprise, I sat up and I didn't see anybody, but there was definitely somebody there. I knew there was someone there. And I got the creepiest feeling of being watched and like really watched where you feel like someone is just staring into your soul. Um, I am very sensitive to this kind of thing and to 
ghost or whatever you want to say. So I knew somebody was there, and I just remember I laid back down really quick, and I pulled the pillow over my head, and I was just terrified, and I didn't hear anyone walk away, and I didn't hear anybody move, and I finally fell back asleep and didn't say anything to anyone the next day. Cause my grandma really was very much a sensitive but very much didn't want to talk about it, didn't want it discussed in her house. Um, people would try to bring Ouija boards in her house. And it was like absolutely not, not doing that in my house. So I didn't really say anything to my grandma. Um, but, you know, this went on all the time. I, like I said, I slept there a lot. And you would routinely almost every night hear someone pacing from all the way through the hall apartment, through this hallway. And they'd get to the end and they would turn around and they would walk straight back through to the kitchen. This was going on all, uh, probably a good four or five hours a night. And it was always not thinking of it back then, but knowing now, definitely dead time. It was middle of the night, two, three, four in the morning. It kept happening, didn't really say anything to anyone. And one night something woke me up and I didn't know what it was. It wasn't necessarily a sound or the walking, but something woke me up and I looked right over to an old rocking chair my grandma had in the corner. And there was enough light coming in from the street lights, <clears throat> excuse me, to illuminate enough to see that the rocking chair was actually rocking. I could see the shadow of the bottom of the rocking chair against the wooden floor. And it was rocking back and forth on its own. She didn't have any pets. There was no one else in the room with me. Um, really no reason that this chair would have started rocking. But the thing that really scared me was the fact that it didn't really stop rocking. Um, I probably laid there and I was completely terrified. I had the, again that feeling of, of just intense staring, just watching, just definitely looking at me. And I was just afraid to move. I remember being that afraid to not even want to move. I, would, I was looking just with my eyes moving. I wouldn't even move my head. <laughs> and I laid there just terrified and finally fell back asleep. But I would say I probably would estimate that I laid there watching this rocking chair steadily rock back and forth on its own for at least 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and I don't know, somehow fell asleep. And um, that was that with the rocking chair. But not long after that, my grandpa, who was a World War II veteran, slept in the middle room in the house and it was the hallway went right through this room and he woke up one day and was really upset and you know started kind of yelling out and asking everybody what the hell is up with this person or whoever this is pacing this apartment all night long like I can't get any sleep it's driving me crazy like who is pacing and my grandma got upset with him when she realized he was saying that it was, you know, not any of us, but it was like some unexplained pacing, she got upset with him and told him to stop talking about it. Um, but he, as soon as he talked about it and he showed anger towards it, it really revved up, but it revved up just around him and in the room that he would sleep in. So you would still hear the pacing, but it, it would seem like the pacing would only go from the kitchen into the room that he was in and turn around and go back to just to really target him and his sleeping area. And one night he was sleeping, and for one reason or the other, he had a small blade, like a hacksaw blade that he had done some kind of repair in the house with days before. And it was sitting up in the corner on a box that was there, a couple boxes that were piled in the corner. And he woke up having pain in his head and didn't know, you know what was happening. And he got up and he realized that the, 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 the blade, the saw blade, was laying next to his pillow and his head was bleeding and he was bleeding you know not crazy bleeding but bleeding enough and had a a big scratch a big cut on his head i would say the cut was you know it was kind of thin because it was a thin blade but it was probably a good three to four inches long on his on the top of his head kind of closer to his forehead and there was no reason that that, that that would fall like that, um, and especially not just fall, but he kept saying how hard it, you know, it must have fallen to cut him like that, that it came down with force. Again, my grandma got upset with him, told him to stop it. It's just that you had it sitting up there, and it's your own fault. Don't talk about it. And uh, my grandpa continued to talk about it, and then he said that it started slapping his feet in the middle of the night, hitting his feet and slapping his feet and not letting him sleep. And so the more he talked about it in, in the apartment, the more the activity was revving up. And my grandma told him to stop talking about it. And he did. And around this time, I was probably about 12. Um, and I was a kid who loved to take really long showers and baths. And I couldn't do that at home, but I could do that at my grandma's house. 
I remember sitting in the bathtub, letting the bathtub fill up, but letting it fill up with the shower running, like, down on me. And something caught my attention, and I looked up to see, just for a split second, my grandpa's disposable razor that he would leave sitting on the medicine cabinet. There was a light on either side of the medicine cabinet, and he would set it up on the left side on top of this light. It was flat surface. He set it there all the time. It never fell. Never thought about it. I looked up just in a split second to see this thing either hovering or just coming over the shower curtain um, because where it sat was lower than where the shower curtain started. I would say it probably would have had to raise up a good six to seven inches to get over the shower curtain. And before I could even react, I remember just kind of gasping because seeing it and feeling something really quickly and before I could really even react to it, that disposable razor came flying down on my leg and hit my leg and it cut my leg and it also left just this big bruise. It was like a, a kind of like a hematoma under, under my skin on my leg. And of course, when this happened, I was freaked out. I was terrified. I, you know, grabbed a towel. I think I even left the shower running, ran out, went and told my grandma what happened and she's, you know, cut it out. It just fell. And then when I was trying to explain to her, no, it came over the shower curtain. It was in the air. She said, well, where is it? You know, where did it hit you? Let me see it. And she was quite surprised when she saw my leg because it had started already to bruise and it had just happened. That I had a really big bruise and a cut on my leg that later turned to a probably, mm, I would say a golf ball size bruise with a lump on it and a cut. And there was no explanation to even if a razor fell, it might scrape you or it might whatever, but two things that happened was it came, moved on its own. It was suspended in the air. And as soon as I saw it, it just moved so fast and incredibly fast and incredibly hard for a small little plastic disposable razor. Um, yeah, and that's, that's just one of many stories that I have about that apartment and others, and I would love to share them with you. Um, because later on, uh, what we did find out was that uh, there was a young man that lived in that apartment with his father, and he was a young adult at the time, and he had a, a drug and alcohol problem, and he ended up actually hanging himself from the kitchen light. So I kind of feel like it was him, it was definitely him. I think he was angry, and um, he was still there. He was still in this apartment. Little did we know that somebody had actually hung themselves and that was verified through neighbors and even friends in the neighborhood of this man that killed himself and I later saw what I believed to have been him outside um, kind of in a walkway that would lead into the back of this apartment so I would love to talk to you guys further give you more stuff I hope you enjoy it I love the show thanks guys bye I think that's one of the more aggressive ghost stories we've had that's not demonic. Yeah. As far as it being an unhappy soul, presumably the person that hung themselves. Yeah. My goodness. Could you imagine waking up realizing that um, something tried to saw your head in your sleep? And it wasn't me? <laughs> I was trying to think about it, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the, uh, the power saw is on the nightstand and we know it wasn't there when we went to bed. Hey, um, it's not that far on the dresser. There's two drills that have been there a week. So it's true. It's true. What's all that red stuff on the uh, the end? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that would be rather disturbing. It's it's like yeah. the ghost is on a mission for murder. Yeah. I wonder how many deaths are uh, are actually caused by ghosts, like directly, not just uh, you know someone tripped down the stairs. Well, I think it'd be hard to determine because of accidental death. Mm -hmm. It'd be ruled probably accidental sure. death. Well, and, I mean, yeah. and that's like the number one thing. Is, yeah. Because that encompasses so many things. But I mean, has there ever been, you know, we, we hear the stories of objects moving and things of that nature. What about the object, the knife, the saw, the whatever, going at the person and killing them by the ghost? Not accidental, not like, like a tripping or something mm -hmm. like that, but literally... 
It moved it, and it moved it in this way, and this is where it went. It didn't fall on the person. It Paranormal did it. murder. Yes, literally murder with intent by a ghost. I don't know. I mean, people kill people when they're sure. alive. Why wouldn't they try to do it when they're dead? Oh, if they have the ability to do it. I mean, do they have the force? Could they have the force? I mean, how how often is it where there's just an un you know cold case murder? Nobody knows what the hell happened, and they still don't. Where that is simply the answer. Could be. I don't know. Odd. 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. And that wraps up the uh, the program today. Hope you all had a great time. What did you learn today? What did I learn today? That um, a, a ghost can try and saw your head in your sleep. That's going to be like nightmares for me now. Yeah. Because I'm kind I of could a see that. home improvement person. So it's home yeah. improvement gone wrong. Yeah. You make a great Dateline special, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I, I, I learned uh, what the meaning of, of shining deer was. Yeah, I learned about that, too. And that you've tipped a cow in your life. That's uh, yep. also something I... You needed to know that. Glad I know it now. Uh, if you like the show, keep us on the air. Become an EPP extra podcast person. Sign up on our website at ghostpodcast.com. Five bucks a month is all it is. Or you can sign up for a full year, get one of those months free, and a bunk bed bell. Do that, ghostpodcast.com, and we greatly appreciate that. Thank you if you've already done that. If not, hey, you like this, please help us stay on the air at uh, ghostpodcast.com. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online.